right, thank you, Brother Luke. Let's take our Bibles. We're going to be uh, back in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 4, and we're going to read uh, verse 10 down through verse number 20 there. And we'll look at the parable of the sower once again. This is part two. I saved the good sermon for tonight. Okay. I just fed them scraps this morning, but we'll get the good stuff tonight. So Mark uh, chapter 4. In verse number 10, and we'll read down through verse number 20. And um, let's read from verse number 9 down through verse number 20. Verse number 9, Mark chapter 4. When you found your place, let's stand together uh, for the reading of God's word. Mark 4, verse number 9. Uh, and he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and yet not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things enter in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. And uh, let's stop there, and let's uh, pray. Let's all pray together, and we'll ask God for a blessing tonight from His word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for just a, a, the privilege of being your children. We thank you for... Uh, the Holy Spirit, our guide and teacher. We thank you for the precious eternal word that we get to open up tonight and we get to meditate therein once again. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just illuminate our minds. And Lord, I pray that as you said here in this text, that we would have ears to hear uh, what's being said. I pray that you would help us to have an inquiring heart like your 12 disciples and others who wanted to know and understand this parable. And Lord, I pray that you give us understanding uh, hearts. I pray that our hearts would be sensitive to the Word of God tonight. And Lord, help us just to know a little bit uh, deeper uh, the workings of your kingdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So Jesus says three times here, Him that has ears to hear, let him hear. That's what he says in verse number 9. Uh, as he's preaching, verse number one, we see he's at the Sea of Galilee, uh, and he enters into a ship, and this is going to be a natural amphitheater, and with the backdrop of the lake, uh, really he'd be able to whisper, and if everybody was quiet and everybody was seated, they'd hear every single word uh, that the master's preaching. It talks about the regions that come out to see him at this point. There's probably thousands of people. Uh, there's a 250-mile radius or so that people have walked and traveled that far to see Jesus and that far to hear Him. Uh, and so, I mean, great effort, uh, great, uh, great uh, toil physically was put into going to hear the Lord Jesus Christ preach. Uh, but then, then, even then, after this great effort was put in, multitudes of crowds around the Lord Jesus Christ as he sits on his floating pulpit and preaches to them. He says there's two groups of people. Now, uh, notice, you, if you will, to verse number three. He says, hearken, and this, this is an exclamation point. 
This is an emphasis here. He's saying, and it is a command uh, that to hear what I'm about to tell you. Hearken, behold, a sower went forth to sow. Uh, in Matthew chapter number 13, uh, the disciples wanted to know, why do you speak to them in parables? Here in this portion of scripture, they come up to him and say, can you give us the interpretation of this parable? Uh, so out of the multitudes there, uh, there's only a, a select group of people that want to dig a little deeper and really want to have understanding about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And notice that uh, the people who wanted to, to know about, more about the Lord Jesus Christ's uh, message here are the twelve whom in the last chapter he ordained twelve that they should be with him and that they should go forth. And we made this point last chapter is that if you are saved, the reason why you are saved is so that you can experience and that you can have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. What we're going to see in this parable is how we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is that we experience him through his word. This is the eternal word of God. And as it's spoken, as it sounded forth, as it enters into our ears, we have an opportunity to believe with our heart and experientially uh, we get to know the Lord Jesus Christ through his word. So look at verse number nine again. And he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the voice going out is the same tonight from our Lord. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, so there's always wisdom calling out in the streets, calling unto all to come in unto her. Uh, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I'll gather you as a hen doth gathered. Uh, her brood, but ye would not. So the Lord calls to me tonight, the Lord calls to you tonight, and calls us to himself that we would be underneath the shelter, underneath the banner of his word, and that we could experience him through his word. This invitation is the same tonight. Notice this, uh, is that the disciples are given mysteries of the kingdom. He said, I am going to let you know how the kingdom works. And what we said is mystery. When we come across the word mystery in the Bible, uh, this is a sacred secret, okay? And it's a mystery because these things are supernaturally and spiritually understood. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, that, uh, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher uh, and that, that uh, the Lord says, I'm going to let you know the workings in my kingdom. So they're a sacred secret but also they are an open secret. They are right here on the pages of Scripture. And if we want to delve into them, if we want to know them, we can. Uh, but if we don't care, we are not going to know them. And as the Bible says, the simple pass on and are punished. And so here he, he says this in verse number 10 again. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. And notice verse number 12. And it says that seeing they may see and not perceive, and that hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. How many of you ever come across this portion of scripture in your Bible and you find that is one of the very hard sayings of Jesus? I'm not telling them so they won't hear uh, and so they won't see and so that they won't be converted and they won't be delivered from their sins. How many of you ever read your Bible before and that kind of like, I mean, I should, shouldn't it? cause you to pause. Uh, it's there in Matthew chapter number 13. Uh, it's uh, here in Mark chapter number 4. It's in Luke chapter number 8. And then also it is at the close of the book of Acts in Acts chapter number 24. Uh, the same thing the Apostle Paul says and closes the book of Acts with that portion of scripture. Uh, that is found in Isaiah chapter 6. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 is one of the favorite chapters of the Bible. When we get there, you'll remember it, okay? Isaiah chapter number 6. It 
So first thing we're looking at tonight is Christ's motive for speaking in parables. And uh, if you look at Isaiah chapter 6, I won't read this whole section, but look at verse number 5. Remember Isaiah, he saw the Lord high, holy, and lifted up in his train, filled the temple. Uh, and uh, in verse number 5, at this great sight, and uh, really, you know, we see Jesus through faith. Uh, and Isaiah had this, uh, this physical vision. You and I get a spiritual vision. Uh, the day that we were, were saved, we saw Jesus through his word, uh, and we would have had the same exact response here as Isaiah. We would have been undone. Anytime anybody comes into the presence of God in the Bible, they always fall on their face. You know, Ezekiel, every time, uh, you know, every time he sees the Lord, uh, I think six times in the book of Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, he falls flat on his face. Call him the flat-nosed prophet. Boom, flat on his face. Boom. And uh, even John, remember, the beloved disciple, he leans his head on Jesus' breast. He can hear the Savior of the world's heartbeat. Uh, and then in Revelation chapter number one, he, he sees the exalted Christ. And what does he do? Falls flat on his face, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so when we see a revelation of the Lord through his word and we by the Holy Spirit, uh, we see the Lord and who he is, uh, we have the same response. We feel pretty good about ourselves. We feel pretty spiritual. Isaiah could have said, hey, I'm a prophet. Uh, you know, I'm much better than those rascals I'm preaching to, that's for sure. Uh, and then all of a sudden he sees the Lord and he changes his tune. So verse number five. Then I said, woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. So we see the Lord high, holy, and lifted up. We fall on our face in humility and say, Woe is me. Now when the prophet says woe, he is declaring judgment upon himself. He knows that he is, uh, he is due the judgment of God. And when we, we don't really realize this, uh, when we compare ourselves among ourselves, you know, uh, pots uh, calling the kettle black. And, uh, you know, I'm a pretty good person. You know what that means? Well, I, I'm better than most of my friends and neighbors, that's for sure. That's what you're saying. Uh, but uh, you don't compare yourself with me, and I don't compare myself with you. We compare ourselves to the Lord, and when we get a vision of the Lord, we fall flat on our face. Woe is me in humility. And fortunately for us, a coal comes from off the altar that Christ's sacrifice uh, would cleanse us from all sins. And when we have the spir spiritual perception that we are truly forgiven in God's economy, uh, we are ready. Whom shall I send and whom shall go for us? Here I am, Lord. Send me. So he's going to go on a great commission. Note, if you will, in verse number 9. And he said, Go and tell this people... Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Then I said, I, Lord, how long? And he, and he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitants and the house without man and the land be utterly desolate and the Lord have removed men far away and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Uh, so the Lord quotes this portion of scripture in combination with the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, let me remind you uh, from this morning that, uh, well, let me ask you, let me see. I might want to quit the ministry after I ask you these questions, but who is the ultimate sower? Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, you and I are in Christ's stead, in his shoes. We stand in his place as we go. But the good news is uh, all power is given on me in heaven and earth. 
Uh, and as the Father sent me, so send I you. Go ye therefore in all the world, preach gospel to every creature. Uh, so I go in the power of Christ, and I go as a representative of Jesus Christ, uh, and I am the body of Christ. He is the head. And so when I am telling somebody about the message of the gospel, uh, they are going to have to give an account as if Jesus Christ himself stood in front of them and spoke to them personally because he did by his spirit through his bride, Amen. through his church. Yeah. So Jesus Christ is the sower. And remember what the seed is? What is a seed? So it's not incorruptible seed. It is the word of God. Um, John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are power, they are life. And remember, the disciples wouldn't go away because why? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We are here for your word. You are the word. We're here for you, and we're here for your word. We're partaking of your word. We're partaking of you. Uh, so the sower goes forth to sow, and the, the uh, seed is the word of God, that quickening, powerful word of God that has the power to change people's lives forever give them an eternal home in heaven um, all scriptures given by inspiration uh, it is the god breathed word uh, god breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul and so this word when you speak this word whew, yeah. that's what happened if you listen really quietly you can hear it just kidding you can't hear it uh, but that's what's going on when you are speaking the word of god that is the holy spirit breath and it has absolute power to change people's life. And then remember the soil. What is the soil? The hearts. So is there any problem with the sower, Jesus? No. Is there any problem with the seed? Is there trouble with the word of God tonight? No. Is there trouble with the soil, the hearts of men? You better believe there is. You better believe it. So the problem is not with Jesus, and the problem is not with the seed. Uh, uh, in the problem is with the soil. The problem is with men's hearts. Amen. And so Amen. as Jesus is speaking, he petitions people to hear them, hear him. And if they would not hear him, he said, I'm not going to give you any further revelation. You know what the Bible says? Cast not your pearls before swine. Uh, another thing it says in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, it says, answer not a fool according to his folly. So we see from this point in Christ's ministry, he is going to set up a barrier where people are not going to be able to enter into knowledge with him intellectually. They're going to have to experience Jesus in their heart. Turn, if you will, to John chapter 7. So Christ's motive in speaking in parables, number one, here's going to be the number one reason, is to protect unbelievers. To whom much is given, much is what? Uh, and for instance, Christ's hometown, Capernaum, thou art lifted up into heaven, thou shalt be cast into hell, be more tolerable on the day of Sodom and Gomorrah than for you, Capernaum. Now, as far as outward licentious sins, what was worse, Sodom and Gomorrah or Capernaum? I bet Capernaum was a nice little, you know, it was like Mayberry or something, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and Christ says, you are going to be cast down into hell. And what Christ is going to do here. He's going to set up a barrier saying that uh, the disciples are going to have intimate working knowledge of who I am. But to those who are without, remember there is a phrase here in our portion of scripture, those who are within and those who are without. Where is Jesus' family in this, this storyline? We're going to tie this in at the end. Without, outside. You know what happens here in this story? Is, is um, We see at the end of chapter number three, his family is without. Uh, Luke in his gospel mentions the same verbiage, the same terminology, but it puts it at the end of the sermon, and it says his family was without wanting to see him, and he got on a ship and went to the, <laughs> to the gatherings. You know what he did? He completely blew off his family. Uh, so he got done preaching the sermon. They set out from the shore. See you later, Ma. And took off towards the gatherings, uh, and right on the middle of the sea, Jesus calms the storm, 
there's a maniac out there. The devils are driving him crazy, but he sees Jesus. He can, you can look across the Sea Galilee and see where the swine ran down uh, the cliff there into the water. So this man up here in the caves on the sea, he sees how Jesus takes a troubled sea and he calms it. And he's wondered if that Jesus can do the same for him, that he's in ter turmoil in his own life spiritually and wonders if Jesus can do the same thing. Uh, and so at this point in Christ's ministry, his family's without. They don't understand. They're not having relationship with him. They're not having fellowship with him. They are on the outside. And remember this, another thing about the within and the without. Uh, those who thought they were in, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and uh, you know, the leaders of the synagogue and everything, were they for the most part in or out? Out. The publicans and the sinners, those who really needed a savior, needed a physician, were they for the most part in or out? In. And even John the Baptist said uh, to the religious leaders of his day, he says, you, he says, you are going to be shut out of the kingdom and you are going to see publicans and harlots enter in before you. I bet they really liked that sermon. You know, I bet he, he won a lot of, you know, how to win friends and influence people there, right? Uh, and so there was that group within, there's group without. And in John 7, in verse number 17, um, it says there, well, look at verse 16. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, and, or Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Um, who is my mother and who is my brothers? Uh, them that do the will of my father. Now let's look at this verse again. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. You know that you can't intellectually determine whether or not that Jesus Christ is the Savior? You know what the Bible says? You have to experience Him. You have to believe with your heart. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, that that you, have to, you have to faith Him in order to uh, grow in knowledge of who He is. It's not an academic pursuit. It does have to do with your mind, your will, and your emotions, but it doesn't stop with your mind. Um, turn, if you will, back to our text here. In chapter 4, uh, look at verse number 2 really quick. And it says, He taught them many things by parables and said unto them, notice this, in his doctrine. John 7, 17, said, If any man will do my will, then he shall... No, experiential knowledge, my doctrine. Uh, in, in the Lord speaks in parables. His motive in speaking in parables is to protect unbelievers and then to instruct believers. Uh, look back at uh, verse, or look at, look at 12, verse 12. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable, and how then will ye know all parables? So this is the chief parable. This is the crown parable. Jesus said, If you don't understand this parable, you will not understand any of my parables. So let me ask you this question. Is this parable important? Yes. yes. It's of chief importance. Um, so it's important for his disciples to know this. And so the disciples pull up their chair, and then there's also those with the 12 disciples there. And Jesus gives them uh, his instruction. He gives them his means for reaching the world. And uh, verse number 14, the sower soweth the word. Um, look at Matthew chapter 28. 
Matthew chapter 28, and um, well, look at verse number 18. So here's a great commission. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Um, so Christ is preaching. So if we got a great crowd, um, let's say you had tens of thousands of people uh, here in a crowd and you're speaking to them, um, would you speak to them in parables and put a veil in front of this crowd and say, if you want to know what I'm talking about, see me after the service. <laughs> this is essentially what the Lord Jesus Christ does. He does the exact opposite in his evangelism as what we would do. Uh, and so those who want to know him and experience him through his word uh, and follow him because of his word, he explains to them the mysteries of the kingdom. And when he commands them to go forth and he says, and, and preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them, uh, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Do you think the Great Commission um, had to do with a continuation of Christ's ministry? It had everything to do with that. Jesus' style and Jesus' fashion of ministry was to be the disciples' ministry. How many people were saved at Pentecost? Because this is going to be the the fulfillment. I mean, I'll send you the promise of the Father. Luke, he says, tarry ye in Jerusalem till you endued with power from on high. Uh, and this is going to be as Joel uh, spoke about, Joel chapter number two, talks about the former and the latter rain, talks about the sowing of the seed, and that day is going to come uh, that they're going to sow, and, and the Holy Spirit's going to come down like rain. And, uh, and how many people are going to get saved? How do they know who got saved and who didn't? They counted hands. Keep your hands up for a second. Let's look. Let's look. Uh, let's look at Acts chapter number two. So Christ in this parable. We see his motive for speaking in parables, protect unbelievers, instruct believers. We see Christ's means for reaching the world. Uh, we see Christ the sower, Christ um, the word is uh, the seed. And in Acts chapter number 2, notice that there in um, verse number 41. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And there's the Great Commission. Go ye therefore in all the world preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them. We have baptismal service here. We're baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh, and so here's, here's what happens there. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and that same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles. What's that next word? Creed. Doctrine. Not creed, Ernie. I don't know what you're reading tonight. But. Um, if you obey my word, then you shall know my what? Doctrine. So here's what happened, and here's how they counted the people. Again, this wasn't hands raised. They didn't get all people say uh, the prayer or anything like this. They knew 3,000 people were saved because they were saved, baptized, added to the church, and they continued. You know what the ultimate goal of soul winning is? Is creating disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just a crowd of hearers, but people who truly know the Lord and who have experienced him through his word. Now let's look back at the parable and uh, we'll highlight a few different things about the soil, and then we'll be done. So Christ's message to us, two, twofold. 
I believe. One is, uh, we had the application this morning, uh, is to be careful how you hear. I don't know if you got this. I'm not going to go over it. Um, but it was very good. George Whitfield, how to listen to preaching. Very, very, very good. Very practical. Now, George Whitfield was Prince of Preachers. Uh, he was... he preached a greater percentage of Americans probably than Billy Graham did. I mean, he was probably far greater in percentage-wise scale. Eighty percent of all uh, colonists heard George Whitfield preach. Uh, and uh, he was a great orator. Uh, when he was a young man, when he was a teenager, he worked in theater. Uh, if you ever Google image, don't do it right now. A picture of George Whitfield. You can see a little bit in the picture from the insert this morning. He, um, he was a little bit cross-eyed. Had a, some sort of eye went inward. And they said it, at, it added to the drama. I don't know if you never knew if he, he was looking at you or not. Which, you know, he had one eye looking at you and one eye looking over here uh, when he preached. And he, I mean, he would have you eating out of the palm of his hand. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, wrote in his autobiography how George Whitfield tried to convert him. Uh, and Benjamin Franklin said, I, I'm afraid he was never successful. But he did tell about how that he was raising money for the orphanages down in Georgia uh, and that he couldn't help but give. He's like, I'm not. He said, I came there determined not to give a penny to George Whitfield. He said, and by the end of George Whitfield's uh, pitch for the orphans, he said, I pulled every single, uh, every single dollar out of my pocket and it was going towards the orphanage down in Georgia. Uh, and I was uh, reading one time about how George Whitfield, I can't remember what, um, what king, he, w he had an audience of, of a king, I can't remember what king it was uh, in Europe, in old country, uh, and it was, you know, king can't come out in audience to, you know, with tens of thousands of people, so he was in the king's court, and he was preaching to the king, and he was telling about how a man was going along a precipice, uh, and there, there was some sort of danger down here, and, and he said that uh, it was so realistic to the king, of course this is the before the days of television, right? I'm sure people had, you know, greater powers of imagination when they listened. But uh, the king jumped out of his throne and thought for sure he's going to fall off the precipice uh, that, that George Whitfield was talking about. Uh, but George here in this, uh, this insert, a, f a, few, a few things about hearing a preacher preach, and it is a Christian duty uh, to hear preaching. And uh, we should hear much of it. Uh, the, the expounding, the exposition of the word so that we can think about the word, people explaining the word of God to us. Uh, he says a few things. Here, here's just uh, his highlights there. Come to hear them, not out of curiosity, but out of sincere desire to know and to do your duty. Come to hear and to know what you're supposed to do. That's exactly what Christ is talking about uh, here in this portion of scripture. Where, uh, Jack Hiles saying, Great order, great preacher, pack out a 7,000-seat auditorium every single Sunday. He said he had three types of hearers. He said, I've got, I've got a group of people that believe everything I say verbatim. If I said the sky is purple, they'd believe it, you know. Uh, and he said, then I got a group of people that hear what I have to say, and they check it with the Word of God, uh, and that's where you want to be, right? Uh, and, and he said, then I got a third group. He says, these people... Don't believe anything I say, but they love to come hear me say it. And so George, you know, George Whitfield, I mean, this eloquent, uh, waxing eloquent, knew all about this. He says, you come to hear what your duty is according to the word of God. Number two, he says, give diligent heed to the things that are spoken from the word of God. Uh, so we verify on our page, yes, this indeed is what God is saying through his word. We, ch we check. Uh, number three, do not entertain even the least prejudice against a minister. Uh, this is very helpful because there's, you know, all sorts of characters and, and foibles of different people who get behind a sacred desk. Uh, and so don't uh, come to church and not listen. I can't, I just can't listen to this guy. If uh, somebody's opened up the Word of God, look at the Bible and look at what they're talking about from the Word of God. Number four, be careful not to depend too much on a preacher or think more highly of him than you ought to think. Again, that goes back to verifying everything according to the word of God. Number five, he said, make particular application to your own hearts of everything that is delivered. The well, preacher says, draw a circle around yourself and fix everything inside that circle. Um, 
And number six, George Whitfield says, pray to the Lord before, during, and after every sermon. And I can tell you as a preacher, one thing I need, same as you need, is lots and lots of prayer. So prayer should be made during this preaching. So here in regards to listening, there's four different kinds of reactions, four different kinds of soils. Um, look, if you will, there, Mark 4, verse 15. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh and immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Um, anytime the word of God goes forward, who else gets involved? The devil's there. So the devil fights real ministries. And I really want to be a real minister. And I don't want to just come and play games or be a social club. I mean, there's wonderful social parts of a church and congregation but we want to be a Bible preaching and Bible teaching church. Uh, and so who is going to attack and who is going to try to steal seeds? Satan. Um, and then we see in verse 16, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Um, Luke in 8, chapter 8, it says that they rejoice with joy. But they have... And this is important. If you're in the habit of underlining things in your Bible, I would underline this phrase. Having no root in themselves. So we've got a lot of mature Christians here tonight. How many ever see someone come, make a profession of faith, get really, really excited, and, um, I mean, sign up for everything, and uh, they just, and everyone's rejoicing at how this person is just uh, growing, uh, and then something happens and they're gone. How many of you ever seen that in church? Okay, pretty much everyone. You don't have to be in church for very long to see this happen. Um, and, it, and the Lord tells us the reason why. They have no root in themselves. So everything in their life, this decision was superficial. It had to do with the exterior of their life, and it didn't penetrate their heart. The shallow ground soil would be like a limestone and shallow dirt on top of the limestone uh, and so it's like those little planters. So that when the seed hits, the root doesn't go deep, but instead it grows up. So now that I'm a Christian, what, I mean, what do I need to, what do I need to wear? Um, what kind of music should I listen to? Uh, what, and er, you know, everything has to do with the ex external form. And you can change really quick externally. But where's God after? He's after your heart. So, so a lot of times a real conversion, it takes time for them to grow because a lot of the growth has to take place inside their heart. Remember, the only response is joy, and there is no repentance. For someone to get saved, they've got to break up their fallow ground and sow not among the thorns. I mean, th their heart is not broken. Uh, when you're saved, true salvation is a death to yourself. It's not easy to die. You have to die to yourself, be broken, the seed of the word of God penetrates your heart. Uh, this, is not, um, this is not the case with the shallow ground person. So they're having no root in themselves and so endure, but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now a true Christian talks about when the sun is risen in the beginning of the chapter. The sun is a picture of persecution. Uh, does the sun typically make a plant grow and become stronger? Uh, so if you decide to follow Jesus and persecution arises, uh, it, it, it's tough, but you know what it actually makes you do? Grow and become stronger. And then verse 18, And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, enter in and choke the word, and it become unfruitful. Um, so... The gospel is crowded out of this person's life. The ground is not cleared. And, uh, and you know, a mature, observant Christian, some, you know, sometimes you can tell with people, there's just something missing here with this person. I know they've been coming. I know they've been reading the Bible. I know they've been doing this. But there seems to be something missing. Uh, and then before you know it, man, you don't see them on Sundays. Hey, man, I missed you last Sunday. 
well, I had this or I had that, the other. And after a while, they just get pulled completely. They say, where is so-and-so? Well, you want to say, well, you know, their job and their this and their that and their uncle and their brother and their nephew and their car and their house and this and that. But you could really say, well, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things choked out the word, and they have become unfruitful. Now, we see here, verse number 20, here is the good ground, and the good ground soil. And it says, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and he shall bring forth fruit in his time. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And so remember, I think last Sunday night, we're talking about uh, the Lord speaks to us through his word, and he warns us, he rebukes us through his word. Uh, and if that's not enough, the Lord spanks us. Whom the Lord loves, he also chastens every son. Okay? If you don't, if you spare the rod, uh, you spoil the child. And that's not how the verse goes, though. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if you don't, uh, if, you, if you leave off the rod, uh, man, I'm trying to think of the proverb there. But it, it essentially says that uh, <laughs> your child will be bound for hell. So is he a good father? Does he chasten all of his own? Yes, sir. Yes. He chastens his own. Okay? And then we say if that chastening, that spanking doesn't work. So first he speaks, then he spanks, and then Ananias and Sapphira, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, some sleep, some are dead. Uh, then he separates. He sends them to their room. That's how the, Lord's, that's how the Lord handles those who are his. Uh, and, and so everyone who is in the vine, John chapter number 15, he brings forth fruit. Remember, he prunes, he purges, that they might bring forth more fruit. Uh, and the mark of those who are saved is there is going to be some sort of fruit in their life. And here we have in Pentecost, 3,000 people getting saved, 3,000 people getting baptized, 3,000 people... Uh, are added to the church, and they're continuing uh, in the disciples' doctrine, considering the doctrine, the breaking of bread, and in prayers and of fellowship. You know what the apostles get to enjoy? They get to enjoy the fruit of fellowship with these 3,000 new converts, and they get to be the body of Christ together. Here's just a few thoughts on application. Um, we mentioned this morning, so, 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 so. We're not soil samplers, okay? Uh, this, this person looks like a thorny ground person. I'm not going to sow my seed there. No, it just says so unsparingly everywhere. Now, Christ's family at this point is within or without? So right now we would say that they are one of the bad, three bad soils. Does that change? Yes, sir. It does. After the resurrection, we know at least of two of Jesus' brethren, uh, his half-brothers, James, uh, he, led, he led the church in Jerusalem. He was, if you want to call, senior pastor. He spoke for the church uh, in what to do with the Gentile believers in Acts chapter number 15. He wrote the book of James. Uh, and then you have Jude, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so you might have someone in your life uh, that seems uh, thorny ground, hard, uh, stony ground, uh, that wayside soil. Just keep on sowing, keep on sowing, keep on sowing, keep on sowing. Uh, and then also remember this, is that you and I as God's children have a duty to keep our heart sensitive to the word of God. Some great verses we read this morning. Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. Hebrews chapter number 3. Uh, do not let your hearts be hardened uh, through the deceitfulness of sin. Break up your fallow ground, Hosea, uh, and sow not among the thorns. Make sure that your heart is sensitive, broken, contrite before the Lord. 
David in his penitent psalm. He's, he's backslidden. His heart is heart, hardened. Man, he's an adulterer, murderer, liar. That's King David. Nathan comes and rebukes him, humbles himself. Yes, sir. What are the sacrifices of God? A broken spirit and a contrite heart. And to him will I look. He that trembleth at my what? Word. At, at my word. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, this parable. And Lord, we thank you for the insight and uh, the, the mysteries that we get to look into of how your kingdom works. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us just to glean from this parable. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just give us wisdom, discernment. Uh, as we go throughout this world, help us to be sowing the seed everywhere that we go. Help us to spread the word of God. And Lord, help us to be the faithful hearers of the word. Help us to be those who are at your feet, inquiring at your word, uh, as they were in, in Mark chapter 4. And Lord, we thank you for these things. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's all stand. We want to thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time.